August 2021, Kabul, Afghanistan's capital. The few U.S. and NATO troops left in the country try to maintain order while completing the final stages of their withdrawal, as laid out by the Doha Agreement the year prior, by evacuating any remaining officials, personnel, and troops out of Hamid Karzai International Airport. Meanwhile, Taliban forces quickly sweep across not only the capital but most of the provinces around the country as the ANA, or Afghan National Army, falls into disarray and quickly collapses with little resistance. Come the night of August 30th, a photo of Major General Christopher T. Donahue stepping onto a C-17 symbolically and quite literally marks the end of the war in Afghanistan. Now, pretty much everyone is familiar with these events, as while it was happening, as well as the weeks after, much was debated and talked about around the world. Fingers were pointed, opinions and remarks shared, and lives changed. One such topic that was brought up was the overall cost of the war and what was really accomplished with the mention of abandoned, discarded, and captured equipment, vehicles, weaponry, and gear used by not only U.S. and NATO forces, but also by the ANSF or Afghan National Security Forces. One of the most prevalent and widely televised examples was that of uniforms. As Taliban fighters entered major population centers and cities, they boasted a wide variety of camouflage patterns and uniforms. Though there were examples such as Badri 313, the Taliban's then front and center modern special forces unit that touted new and flashy garments, the average Taliban member would be seen oftentimes wearing just a jacket, coat, or pair of pants that was likely acquired through direct or secondhand means from some official force. This can likely be explained by the simple fact that between the start of the war in 2001 and its end in 2021, quite a number of camouflage patterns were worn by forces of all types under the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. These range from foreign supplied to domestically produced and a mix of the two, but the most recognizable, seen, and talked about was the pattern called Spec Force Afghan Forest. Now, on this channel, we've actually covered this camouflage pattern as when it was first seen, it caused quite a stir. If you stumbled across this video or are a returning viewer who hasn't yet seen that one, you should probably watch it first as the pattern had a very interesting origin and was surrounded in controversy, bureaucracy, and issues on almost every level. But being the most widely seen camouflage to come out of the ASNF, it, without a doubt, became a symbol of Afghanistan's modern army at least before the Taliban took control and reinstated the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. So, what happened to it after the collapse of the Afghan National Army? Well, that question comes with a few answers. They can be summed up into three somewhat overlapping categories. Garments that made it to the collector's market, which is pretty straightforward as they're pieces that were either brought back by foreign forces, sold by Afghani soldiers, or otherwise made it out of the country and into the hands of military collectors, airsofters, milsim people, and so on. Most of the pieces that will be shown in this video will fall into that category. Then we have Chinese produced uniforms, which are still very much present online and easy to buy by just about anyone with access to the internet and some money. And finally, believe it or not, pieces that ended up in use by the Taliban and eventually the Islamic Emirate Army. So let's break down the most common pieces seen with the camouflage and talk a bit about them, then we'll swing back to how the pattern remains in use in an official capacity. Okay, so for the main components, we have an ACU, short for Army Combat Uniform, inspired uniform consisting of a patrol cap, jacket, and pair of pants, then a boonie hat, baseball style cap, helmet cover, and finally a coat in the M65 field jacket cut. Now, while the ANA was around, the sources of these vary greatly, and in some cases, versions of each can be slightly different based on the country of manufacture. Generally though, they were either produced within Afghanistan, however the fabric was mostly imported, the United States, or China. Being that the US essentially bankrolled the camouflaging effort, at least initially, a few pieces were actually produced within the US. One such example is the US M65 field jacket. These are pretty much made exactly as most new well, M65 field jackets are, sporting a simple zip-up front closure with a snap button flap, velcro for last name, branch identification, and rank, four pockets, built-in hood that is tucked within the collar when not in use, adjustable velcro cuffs, and larger Velcro rectangles on either sleeve for patches and other identification. This particular jacket was from a contract put out in 2015 and is actually a rejected piece due to minor production issues. As far as collector value goes, anything that's US or Afghanistan produced will fetch a bit more money as they were the bulk of the officially issued and used. A best assessment of these coats is that they fall smack dab in the middle as far as the easy versus hard to acquire spectrum goes, with the easiest being the ACU pieces and hardest actually saving to be headwear. As of right now, they can fetch about 75 to 200 US dollars. Now, before we look at the main uniform, let's quickly talk about headwear 
which seems to be the hardest to find of the lot. Best guess for this is that they were the most often used and thusly worn out and damaged. Being that they were knocked around on helmets and on and off heads, they likely didn't survive as long as the other garments out there. Many areas online where people post or talk about collecting very rarely mention the headgear, and this was likely because of it. Meaning it's a bit hard to put a number on the value, but a good conservative estimate would be anywhere from $50 to $100. So now, let's actually take a look at the most common piece out there, or rather the easiest and most abundant to acquire, even though they aren't all that bountiful, the ACU uniform. This one is actually badged up for a US Army staff sergeant. Chances are he was an advisor or trainer for an ANA unit, or embedded to some capacity, making it all that much more interesting. The patches and name tapes all appear to be theater made, but in pretty good condition. Looking past that though, you can see the cut seems to be very heavily influenced by the original US Army combat uniforms, but also sees elements of the older US battle dress uniform too. This was actually an element that plays a bit of a part in the spending controversy associated with the pattern. The shirt features two inwardly angled chest pockets secured by Velcro, two Velcro strips above them for name and branch tape, a standard pointed collar, a button-up front closure that includes a rectangular Velcro piece for rank patch, slots on either arm to insert padding, a small section to hold three pens or pencils on the wearer's left arm, shoulder pockets with Velcro on them for patches, obviously, and finally adjustable cuffs secured by Velcro. The pants are equally as simple, going for a basic button fly, larger belt loops, two waist pockets, two straight leg cargo pockets that interestingly have one side of the cover flaps sewn with the other buttoned, along with a second button in the middle. Two built-in rear pockets, all of which are secured by BDU style buttons, lower leg pockets closed via Velcro, and finally draw cords to adjust the waist, though they're absent with this set, and bottoms of the legs. Now, this set originated from Afghanistan, but many of those types had tags that were very prone to wearing off through continued use and washing. The ones on the inside collar of this jacket are all but gone, though the one towards the bottom is still relatively intact. Though the tags varied from company to company, for the most part they are pretty interesting as they can provide a lot of information and are sometimes a little funny to read. Essentially, this tag gives us the manufacturer at the top, the designation of the item, which is simply ANA trousers, date and country of manufacture, 2009 and Afghanistan, and then washing directions. The other bit that's a little strange but also a tad humorous is the generic placeholder information in the middle. Either this area was overlooked or just ignored and never filled in, but it shows that these items were supposed to state where the fabric was sourced from as well as manufactured. This was likely due to a lot of fabric being made abroad and imported into Afghanistan where they would be made by local businesses, likely as a way to stimulate the economy of the country when rebuilding it. Anyway, the overall quality of these are pretty good, though they can sometimes have minor irregularities such as asymmetrical stitching, and in this case of the pants, scrap fabric for one of the pockets. Prices for these are a bit hard to say, and here's the reason why. They are still, at least as of this video's publishing, very much easy to source, but most of the ones that are out there are all from China. Which brings us to the second answer as to where these uniforms ended up. Here is a Chinese-made uniform that was, in May of 2022, bought off of AliExpress, sent from China all the way to the United States, and only cost about 45 US dollars after shipping and taxes. Not too bad, right? They all appear to be from one single manufacturer, Rona, but are often seen being sold by a variety of sellers on eBay, AliExpress, and other websites. These Chinese-made ones are often marketed as Afghan army, and there's certainly a good chance some were used by forces in the country, as other branches of the ANSF did have their uniforms created in China, so it's sort of true, but being as the ANA is no longer around, yet these uniforms are new and readily available, that is assuming they aren't just leftover stock from a contract put out before Afghanistan fell to the Taliban, you get the idea. Generally, it's a bit hard to tell whether they have any direct connection to Afghanistan, as they could be dead stock, or just commercially made pieces, or a mix of both. So how do these stack up compared to US and Afghan produced ones? Well, here's a quick side by side. Camouflage pattern wise, for the most part, the shapes are very close and the edges are nearly identical. But if we look at this particular shape, what some have claimed to be a watermark of some kind, you can see that between the US, Afghan and Chinese produced, the Chinese one sees the sizing and spacing between the squares to be a bit different. Regarding the uniform itself, overall it's very close but does see a few minor changes such as the front chest pockets, which are about an inch shorter and are slightly straighter in angle. The buttons are not as nice, but the drawstrings around the waist and bottoms of the legs are actually a bit sturdier. However, the quickest and easiest tell when it comes to identifying Chinese pieces are the tags inside. 
They won't have the green or tan ones seen in US or Afghan produced items, rather opting for a very simple one such as this, which says the size, large regular, and the company. Okay, so back to prices. As said earlier, Chinese ones go pretty cheap. If you look hard enough, you can get them for around 50 US dollars. However, they will often be sold through more trafficked sites for about two to three times that. As for ones made within Afghanistan, they are getting a bit harder to find, but a good estimate, again as of right now, is about $150 to $300 for a jacket plus pants. So that's essentially the collector side of things and how many pieces made their way around the world, but what about the likely hundreds if not thousands of pieces left within the country? Well. To start, many videos and pictures out of Kabul and much of the rest of the country still show numerous Taliban and Islamic Emirate forces wearing an assortment of uniforms, equipment, and gear. Since the Taliban's takeover, some effort has been put into standardizing their uniforms. One such example was actually posted to their Twitter account of all places, even before the full withdrawal of US forces, showcasing new uniforms of the Kandahar police. But again, many pieces seem to have just been grabbed by fighters and members and used to varying extents. They'll often wear them just by themselves, or will add certain patches or insignia affiliated with the Taliban or the Islamic Emirate. Officially, the armed forces of the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan was formed on November 8, 2021, and originally was composed of around 75 to 80,000 men. Since then, the country has been actively trying to equip much of its new army with more modern era equipment gear, and so on, and has had some success in part due to what was taken from the ANA. This includes uniforms. Between the formation of the new army and this video's publishing, numerous photos and videos have come out, including many on the Ministry of Defense's YouTube channel, which showcases a wide variety of units and exercises. For the most part, it seems that a majority of the camouflage uniforms utilized are basic woodland patterns. But others have also been seen in a more standardized capacity, such as Desert Tiger Stripe and other Tiger Stripe-based designs, as seen by various specialty units like Badri 313. This makes sense as woodland camouflage is perhaps the most recognizable copied and used camouflage pattern on the planet and was actually one of the reasons for the ANA's adoption of the digital design in the first place. As for the tiger stripe style patterns, many of those were left over and some have even speculated that the odd ones seen in August of 2021 were actually sourced directly from China. But as for the old standard army issue spec force, it is not nearly as used but has shown up in a few instances. It seems that it is being used in two capacities, most notably as one to be used during training, be it basic or during formal exercises or displays, and second, as a pattern to supplement or fill in for woodland camouflage garments. The first is shown in a few cases, such as a February 2022 display of graduating personnel in the Kabul Training Center, with others coming in May worn by members of certain army corps, like the 207 Al Farouk and 215 Azam during demonstrations. In addition, it appears that certain pieces such as hats and pants are intentionally mixed in together with the woodland uniform by certain units though as well. As for the second category, which appears to be a more deregulated and likely unintentional instance of its usage, is seen sporadically by forces and officials around the country but also by soldiers wearing woodland patterns. Regarding the latter, it seems it's used as a sort of filler piece as they're often hidden among a sea of woodland camouflage in various instances. Somewhat unrelated, it's also worth noting that in a few of these videos captured US Army UCP as well as Air Force digital tiger stripe garments are also worn. So essentially this means it has pretty much fallen in usage, but is still around somewhat. It's no longer the universal and standard pattern of the Army, but seems to have been selected as one to be used for smaller and more specific purposes. Now, this is just speculation, but with the dominant pattern now being woodland, there's a good chance that the Spec Force digital pattern is really only being used until the uniforms wear out and supplies are exhausted. Then again, maybe the Islamic Emirate Army will keep the pattern around, and if they need more stock, all they'll have to do is look to China. But that will about do it for this video. Hopefully this sort of epilogue for the Spec Force Afghan Forest was entertaining and informative. If you enjoyed watching, why not give it a like and subscribe? If not, no pressure. Just be sure to check back soon for more videos right here on Uniform History.